Hello and welcome to Distillations, the science, culture and history podcast. I'm Michal Meyer, a historian of science and editor-in-chief of Distillations magazine. And I'm Bob Kenworthy, CHF's in-house chemist. Before we get started, we have two pieces of news. As you probably know, Distillations is produced by the Chemical Heritage Foundation, a non-profit organization based in Philadelphia. CHF has been going through some big changes recently. In 2015, we merged with the Life Sciences Foundation from the San Francisco Bay Area. And on February 1st, we're leaving our old name behind and becoming the Science History Institute. Science and history are at the core of what we do, and our new name makes that crystal clear. Distillations will keep coming out each month, and you don't need to make any changes to your podcast feeds. You'll still be able to find us online at distillations.org. You can find out more about this transition at chemheritage.org slash news. The other news is that next month, McCall and I will be handing our microphones over to Distillation's new hosts, Lisa Berry Drago and Alexis Pedrick. You might remember Lisa and Alexis from November's Butter vs. Margarine show. They did such a good job, we decided they should keep doing it. Lisa is CHF's public history fellow and an art historian. She's interested in the places where art and science interact and in the untold histories of science, stories about gender, race, class, and power. In her spare time, she writes fiction, makes comics, crafts, and grows too many tomatoes in her little South Philly garden. As the leader of CHF's public programs, Alexis hosts science lectures in bars, is an active member of Philly's geek community, and is known for her popular history talks at Nerd Night. She has a standing Dungeons and Dragons night with her friends, and when she has some spare time, she leads macabre history tours in cemeteries. We're going to miss this gig, but I'm not going to stay away. I'll still be behind the scenes making sure we all get the science right. And the history. That'll be my job. Now let's get back to this episode. Every aspiring chemist has heard of Boyle's Law, the equation that relates the pressure of a gas to its volume. But even if you know about Robert Boyle himself, it's not likely you've heard of his sister, even though she probably talked him through many of his ideas, either in person or through letters. This episode is a collaboration with Ponzi Rush, the creator and host of Babes of Science. Babes of Science is a podcast that tries to answer two questions. Who are the women who change the trajectory of science? And why has it taken us so long to recognize their work? Lady Ranelay sits at her table, penning a note to her brother, Robert Boyle. You might have heard of Robert Boyle. He's a chemist who's famous for his work relating a gas's pressure to its volume. So famous that his name eventually ends up on an equation that every chemistry student knows, Boyle's Law. Some people even refer to Robert Boyle as the father of chemistry. Boyle and his peers are extremely curious about the world around them, but not so sure how to answer their big questions. Before Boyle's 17th century lifetime, thinkers and philosophers had deduced truth and science from ancient philosophy because they didn't believe they could trust their perception of the world. But Boyle argues that it's more accurate to draw conclusions from people's observations about the world around them, or from setting up an experiment to test different ideas about some natural phenomenon. Even if the experiment was unsuccessful, Boyle asserts that it's useful, which, forgive me for pointing this out, but it sounds an awful lot like how science works today, experimentation and observation. And Robert Boyle isn't working alone. His published work refers to partners and collaborators, or he'd publish their response to his ideas. But Robert's most frequent and influential collaborator, his intellectual partner, is his sister, Catherine, even though she never appears in his work by name. Catherine Boyle is born March 22, 1615, in Ireland, one of the Earl of Cork's 15 children. And because her father is extremely wealthy, 
Catherine and her siblings have access to mentors and tutors and education. But, of course, that access looks different depending on if you're a son or a daughter. Sons attend boarding school and work with those mentors and tutors. Robert Boyle, who's Catherine's younger brother by about 12 years, heads to Eton College, which to this day is a really classy boys' boarding school. And Catherine might join in on some of her brother's tutoring sessions that took place at the Boyle family home. But typically, daughters end up in marriage agreements. Catherine, for example, is contracted to marry Sapcott Beaumont. Her father promises the Beaumonts 4,000 pounds, 3,500 paid up front in 1624, which is at least half a million in today's dollars. So Catherine goes to live with the Beaumont family in England when she's just nine years old. And when that agreement falls apart, Sapcott Beaumont's father dies and his family demands more money, so the Earl of Cork slash Papa Boyle says nope and brings Catherine home. There's a new marriage contract just a few years later. Catherine marries Arthur Jones in 1630 at the age of 15. After their wedding, Catherine and her husband travel together, and Catherine seems like she's trying to make it work. The couple has four kids. But in Catherine's letters to family, she refers to her husband's sting and says that he is guilty of play, which is basically 1600s nice for cheating bastard. And as they travel, Catherine builds and maintains her social network, keeping everyone she knows and loves abreast of her life and her relationships. When their travels come to an end, she and her family move to Athlone Castle, a really old castle in central Ireland, which is where Catherine gets stuck during the Irish Rebellion of 1641. She tries to send letters to her family, but it's a lot to ask of the people carrying those messages. One messenger gets stoned to death when she's trying to deliver a note. Catherine finally negotiates her way out of the castle toward the end of 1642. One of the Irish rebels smuggles her out with her children, and they make their way to London. It's right about now that Catherine's husband, Arthur, inherits the title Viscount of Ranelagh. So people start calling Catherine Lady Ranelagh, just in time for them to separate. Now, divorce isn't exactly a regular course of action for your typical 1640s lady. But because Catherine's husband is busy fighting in Ireland, he's a little bit tied up when she asks for that separation. And when she arrives in London, she steps right into the middle of the English Civil War, which is pretty miserable. But it just so happens that the court system isn't functioning during the war, from 1644 to 1660. So many of Catherine's friends and her similarly wealthy and influential brothers begin writing letters and appealing privately to Parliament. Because without a court, it becomes Parliament's responsibility to settle legal disputes. Even Oliver Cromwell takes an interest in Catherine's case. So even though what she's doing is unusual, no one seems to judge her for the separation or for taking custody of her and her husband's children. She's got tons of support, which is a pretty good indicator of her privilege and influence. Catherine even gets to keep her title. Since she and Arthur never formally divorce, she remains Lady Ranelay. Catherine and her children settle in London, and her new house is never empty, really. She opens her home to her family members displaced by war and rebellion in England and Ireland. Two of her sisters move in over the next few years. And since Catherine is no longer under house arrest, or should we say Athlone Castle arrest, she and her brother, Robert Boyle, reconnect. That is, after Robert's done traveling the continent, aka the rest of Europe, because that's what the sons of the Earl of Cork do, for their education, of course. Robert stops in for a visit in 1644, and then he moves to Stallbridge, to one of the Boyle's family estates in southwest England. And using her connections, Catherine helps him find and purchase lab equipment, so he can maintain his own chemistry lab. And that's how the Boyle siblings begin their independent experiments. They spend the next 24 years discussing their work, when they can't visit one another, they report by mail from wherever they are. One of Catherine's and Robert's recurring projects is their work with medical remedies. During the 1600s, most people turned to their communities for medical care, only seeking a doctor when a homemade remedy failed. And these remedies, 
might come from a family book filled with recipes that a mother or a grandmother had collected and written out by hand. Or you could buy a generic collection from a bookstore, which might be filled with recipes that no one had ever actually tested. Or you might have just heard of a remedy from someone in your town. Most of the ingredients are things that you would keep in your kitchen or your home garden. Herbs, spices, pantry items. If it's a more obscure ingredient, or the home garden is small, you could head to the local apothecary and stock up. And there are remedies for everything. Fevers, coughs, toothaches. Some you swallow, others you might rub onto the skin. And if one doesn't work, there are dozens of others to try. Some apothecaries even make their own remedies that you can buy, pre-mixed. Catherine and Robert each maintain their own recipe books with remedies that treat a range of maladies. And within their communities, people seek both Catherine and Robert out for their recipes and strategies. One malady that brings people to their doors is rickets, which is kind of like osteoporosis, but for kids. If a person doesn't get enough vitamin D or enough calcium while their bones are still growing, the bones fracture easily, or they might bend instead of growing straight. That's rickets. Now, neither Catherine or Robert, or anyone else for that matter, knows what causes rickets. But they can recognize the symptoms, the bow-leggedness, or the widened wrists, and they have a remedy that seems pretty effective. Catherine and Robert call their recipe the Flowers of Kolkathar. Kolkathar referred to a concoction made from copper, and to make the remedy, Catherine and Robert mix the Kolkathar with an ammonium salt called sal ammoniac. And even in the mid-17th century, people know that too much copper is dangerous. So these are not ingredients that the apothecary would just fork over to the common housewife. But the apothecaries trust Catherine and Robert, so they supply them with what they need. And if the apothecary's trust isn't enough credibility, Catherine and Robert probably earn their reputation in part through word of mouth. Once their remedies ease one person's ailment, other people want to try it out. Plus, visiting a doctor usually meant that he would try bloodletting, or he'd make you sweat or vomit, all attempts to purge the illness from your body. Robert and Catherine tease the bloodletting and the vomiting practices in their letters to each other. They dole out a lot of snarky commentary about traditional medicine, and they discuss why their remedies are more effective. Because Robert and Catherine are keeping track as they share their remedies with patients. They note when the remedy works or fails with a system of notes and check marks. When Catherine administers the remedies, she even adjusts the dosage for different people or types of bodies. For example, a larger dose for a bigger person. She also follows up with patients to see if they're still experiencing symptoms. If they are, she adjusts her recommendations until they've been cured. Robert and Catherine say that it's the repeated trials that make their practice with remedies more effective than traditional medicine. Robert once claims that they've cured hundreds with one of their remedies. It's possible that he's exaggerating, but the point is they're noting what works and what doesn't, and then they're altering their approach and repeating the process, which makes Catherine and Robert Boyle two early chemists practicing what we might today call the scientific method. Robert would go on to publish some of his and Catherine's work with remedies, and he published some of their other collaborations too. Catherine would suggest an idea, or Robert would ask her to edit an essay he'd been mulling over. But Catherine wouldn't publish that work alone. She would never. The name Lady Ranelagh wouldn't appear in Robert's work. And mostly, this was for modesty's sake. See, for most of the 1600s, women wouldn't publish their own work. Those who did were the exception, not the rule. A woman of Catherine's status didn't want to give anyone the impression that she needed to write to make money. She wanted to project that her estate and her inheritance could support her until her death. And if she had extra money or time, the socially acceptable thing for Catherine to do would be to help others through charity work. Sharing her remedies was a way of caring for her community, but writing or experimenting for recognition might label Catherine as selfish. And her reputation was in question in other ways, too. A woman who wrote was a woman with loose lips. And a woman with loose lips might be loose in other ways, too. Occasionally, women's work would get published after they died. 
that's when they could take credit because their modesty was no longer at stake. Instead, Catherine's work circulates as manuscripts. She would write out a report and someone might copy it by hand. So there would be just a handful of copies in existence. Today, we would think of a manuscript as the first step in the publishing process. But Catherine's goal was simply to share her notes and findings with trusted friends or with the Hartlib Circle, which was kind of a predecessor to the Royal Society. So a network of thinkers scattered across Europe who corresponded to discuss their ideas and their work and their writing. Catherine is writing to members of the Hartlib Circle about all sorts of things, not just her work with remedies, but social reform and politics and education. It's impossible to know if Catherine actually wanted to publish her work and just felt that she couldn't do so. But to take a quick detour, a friend of hers, Lady Marsham, expressed her frustration in a letter to the philosopher John Locke in 1685. However, perhaps you may see me in print in a little while, and then need not be beholden to me, it being grown much the fashion of late for our sex, though I confess it has not much of my approbation because, principally, the mode is for one to die first. And at this time, if I might have my own choice, I have no great inclination that way. But I am not without some apprehension that I am to do so in as little time as within half a year or thereabouts. Okay, so the language is tough, but basically, Lady Marsham is saying, you'll only see me in print if I die first. And though I'm not super stoked to die, I am pregnant, so it could happen. Bleak, Lady Marsham. But back to Lady Ranelay. It's possible that sharing manuscripts and writing letters accomplishes exactly what Catherine wants it to. She shares her work confidently, because she knows it won't circulate beyond her trusted peers, people who know that Catherine is a virtuous and religious woman, and they won't doubt her intentions. And there are nods to Catherine in Robert's work, even if her name isn't there. When Robert writes to a mutual friend, he refers to a kinswoman close to you and I, or he dedicates his work to a mistress of wit and eloquence, or he talks about a mysterious woman named Sophronia, which has to be Catherine. Everyone close to Robert Boyle knows that Catherine is his intellectual companion, his editor, his most trusted collaborator. So the people close to them would understand Robert's reference and know that he's crediting Catherine for her input. And if they don't know Robert or Catherine particularly well, then the mystery collaborator remains a mystery, and Catherine's reputation stays immaculate. Robert and Catherine continue to collaborate mostly by letter until 1668, when Robert moves into Catherine's home in London. She outfits another chemistry lab just for him, this time in her house. And the two of them live there until their deaths during the same week in 1691. I just wonder how many more women were writing about these things in manuscripts or reading the drafts that men were publishing or you know, talking with people holding salons in their houses. Who knows? This is Michelle DeMeo. I am currently the director of digital library initiatives here at the Chemical Heritage Foundation. I'm also a historian of early modern science and medicine. Michelle's been researching Lady Ronelay for more than a decade, beginning when she was in graduate school. It was funny when I started writing my... Uh, my dissertation, I felt like by the end of it, I knew her so well, but I was so scared that I was getting it wrong. And I had this dream where I saw her of all places in a deli and she walked up to me and shook her head and just said, you've got it all wrong. And Michelle DeMeo's hyper focus on Catherine, whom she refers to as Lady Ronelay, made me think differently about how I choose babes of science. Previously, if I couldn't point to a specific contribution that wouldn't exist without the woman in question, I didn't continue with my research. Because there were so many women who contributed very specific things to science, it seemed silly to focus on anyone whose legacy was, well, debatable. But that kind of criteria cuts out a lot of people, and not because of the importance of that person's work, but because of how it's documented. Take, for example, the Boyle family paper trail. When Robert Boyle dies, he has a very detailed will and testament. He 
leaves literary executives to his will. He has color-coded boxes and ribbons, and he says where all of these things can be found in his house. So he's very careful about creating his legacy as he's dying. Whereas Lady Ranelagh, there is no will. The only letters of hers that we know about survive mostly in the archives of the men that she knew. Let's pause for a second and consider the effort of compiling an archive of letters. When you send a letter, it ends up in someone else's mailbox, right? Lady Ranelagh sends hundreds of letters. No, probably thousands of letters. A researcher named Evan Burke analyzed her correspondences and placed her in the top 20 of the more than 700 people associated with the Hartlib Circle. So in order to collect all the letters Lady Ranelay wrote, you would need to know everyone she wrote to, and you would hope that they each maintained an organized letter archive, and perhaps most importantly, that those letters survived over the last 300 years. So yeah, it's hard to track Lady Ranelay down. It becomes a problem almost immediately after she dies. Because the most obvious recipient of Lady Ranelay's letters is her brother, Robert Boyle. And when Catherine and Robert live apart, the letters she sends him demonstrate how involved, how essential her participation is to his thought process. Early in his chemistry explorations, Robert writes to Catherine when something goes awry to express his frustration. They exchange ideas about experiments or applying their remedies. And if they can't find the ingredients they need, like lemons or mistletoe, they ask if the other has any to spare. And when Robert starts writing more formally, Catherine edits it and sends it back to him. When Boyle moves in with her, we have very little evidence because they're not writing letters anymore. Luckily, she and Robert interact with plenty of other thinkers, too, who don't live with them. We do know that she's involved because we have diary entries from people like Robert Hooke and John Evelyn and people who say that they come over and that when they talk with Boyle, they also talk with Lady Ronelay. So we know that it happened. It's just we have far less evidence at that point of what she's actually doing. And of course, if she's reading drafts or attending the experiments, we just don't know because he's not writing that down anywhere. But seriously, she couldn't have kept a diary, possibly on acid-proof paper and placed in a hermetically sealed box? Okay, Michelle says that many women actually did keep diaries, but the documents she's seen reflect the writer's religion and spirituality, not her science experiments. So because there's this gap between what actually happened and what's documented, plenty of other women share the same issue as Lady Ronelay, Michelle says like Anne Conway or Dorothy Moore. What do they all have in common? They lived during the 1600s when people would get super judgy about women who published their work. And I'm sure there's many more. And I think part of the reason we don't know about these women is because they've more or less been erased from the historical record. And it's really sad. So once we move back in time into the 1800s and earlier, we have to account for this gap in the evidence. And Michelle says that historians of science are already taking it one step further. As historians of science, we try to get away increasingly from this kind of genius narrative that there's just one person who created something and changed and shaped the field. Increasingly, what we're trying to do as historians is to think back about these kind of communities of knowledge and the cultural moments and how advances are created in particular moments and why. Even when we can describe in detail the contributions of one particular person, the network surrounding that individual, of course, influences their contribution. Irene Joliot-Curie's correspondence with Lisa Meitner pushed Irene and her husband to keep their research a secret so it wouldn't fall into the wrong hands during World War II. And of course, there's no way Watson or Crick would have come anywhere close to defining the structure of DNA if Rosalind Franklin hadn't shared her images with them. And now, Everyone seems to recognize that Rosalind Franklin is a big deal. These people who are supposedly influencing or changing the field are very much drawing upon the work of a lot of these kind of unknown people that we don't know about. And I think that they are a very important contribution in that way as well. It's time to look past the first authors and the namesakes and start seeking out the partners and the collaborators. This episode of Babes of Science was produced by me, Ponzi Rutch, in collaboration with Distillations Podcast. Babes of Science is a podcast that seeks to answer two questions. Who are the women who changed the trajectory of science? And why has it taken us so long to recognize their work? You can hear more at babesofscience.com or by searching for Babes of Science in your podcast app. Special thanks to Michelle DeMeo for her expertise, enthusiasm, and patience, and to Rigoberto Hernandez and Marielle Carr, for their guidance and editorial savvy. 
And thanks to you for listening. Distillations is more than a podcast. We're also a multimedia magazine. You can find our videos, our blog, and our print stories at distillations.org. Signing off for the last time. For Distillations, I'm Michal Meyer. And I'm Bob Kenworthy. Thanks Thanks for for listening. listening.